Hello, it's Scott Manley here, now with episode 4 of my um, reusable space program. We are now up to launch 16 and we have not wasted a single part. Everything has either been returned safely or is still in space. Now we are launching a new bold step here. We are now sending our first pieces up that are intended to go to the moon. Now the idea is we're going to build a little station in orbit around the moon and you know we have to be very careful because we would really like all the capabilities that we have in our low earth orbit station but make it a lot more light and small because we have to after all you know move this out to the moon and if we have to do a giant amount of construction it's going to take us a lot of time so i've tried to make this as simple as possible we have a fuel tank an rcs tank a crew tank some solar panels and some docking nodes. I mean, it's really as minimal as we can get here. We're trying to make sure that we can do everything we need. Uh, you know, we don't, you can see that there's a, a ring of batteries there rather than, say, a, an RTG to back up things. The crew tank is being used instead of any probe body or anything. There, that means there's no actual control of any spacecraft components unless it is docked to something which has control capability. Uh, it's really like a kind of garden shed that floats in space, a, a place to kind of stash all your stuff and pick it up later when you need it. So yeah, we're just uh, flying it around and this uh, takes us a little bit of time. We're just going to skip in slowly towards the, the station, towards Olympus. You can see that we finally renamed the darn thing. Only took me 16 launches to come up with the, the name and, and actually remember to put it in there. So bringing this in as quickly as possible. Actually, it's, we're coming in very slowly. This is eight times normal speed, which uh, is probably manageable. I think it's the, <laughs> it's the first time acceleration this video system offers that doesn't make noise all the time. So yeah, we're just going to use this in chase cam mode. We're trying to bring it around. We want to dock it on the main docking node. It's quite large. We probably want to go for the middle docking node. Uh, you know, the, the the docking nodes on the side can't take quite as much force, so if we go for the middle one, then it will transfer all the force symmetrically around the station, and it'll be a better thing overall. Uh, once that's docked, we'll be able to uncouple the whole thing, and uh, then we'll send up the spacecraft that will act as a tug to bring it out to, to Moonor orbit. But yeah, we're just bringing this down, I'm aiming for that middle one, and you can see that I'm coming in very, very carefully here. 0.4 meters per second. That's about, well, it's about one foot per second, which is actually still 12 times faster than the space shuttle docked against Mir. So, yeah, it the, the instrumentation in the game really doesn't lend itself to docking. And I believe I've mentioned that before. Okay, so this is us back. This is a two times normal speed, much closer to reality. And there we go. We get, like, perfect mating here. Beautiful. How about that? This station is so huge. So we gotta refuel that um we gotta refuel the, the the space station component. Put in the, the RCS fuel and the regular fuel tank. Also roll out the photovoltaics because we're gonna need those. We do not want the thing running out of power because we forgot. It's quite common for me to do that, is to launch a space probe and then realize that I have forgot to actually un extend the solar panels. So you see, you know, this, this thing is able to supply the barest minimum of survival capabilities. We also have a bunch of fuel in my main tank and I can transfer that in there. Anyway, we return the spacecraft to the planet and launch number 17 is the Munar utility vehicle. It almost never got itself the path there, as you see there. I forgot to turn on the main engine and it uh, began to slow down and stop. But once I figured that out, we've got Bill and Jebediah here um, again. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> um, no, that's another problem. Bill and Jebediah for some real astronauts at last. And they so they're basically flying this uh, slightly modified um, spacecraft. Notice that the ring of RCS tanks actually has a gap in it to fit the nozzles of the the um, the nuclear engines. That was a design over 
well, it was a design oversight, and so I had to fix that after the fact. I mean, actually, somebody pointed out that I should really use, like, a fat RCS tank in there, and they're absolutely right, but when I started building this, I built the whole thing, got it all functional, and then realized that I needed to add the RCS after that. And by that point, I had a whole lot of stuff attached there, and I didn't really have a good place to put in the the RCS uh, tank in the, in the 2.5 the meter format. So I was pretty much stuck. Um, but I'm not stuck here. This thing is now detaching and will fly itself in using just the just the RCS tank <laughs> and just turning here trying to make sure I don't crack into my own rocket uh, oh and I did well I probably smashed the nozzle but nothing exploded so I'm still 100% there <laughs> now uh, I read recently that NASA is actually looking at setting up a, a moon station at L2 um, L2 is the Lagrange point on the far side of the moon, and actually, energetically, it's easier to get to than low, or, uh, low lunar orbit or even the L1 point. So for like your first point of call in terms of uh, off-world locations, the L2 point actually makes a lot of sense because it's uh, it gives you a view to the dark side of the moon. And uh, it requires a very small amount of energy. I mean, you know, I remember me joking about the uh, mechanoid ship in Nexus, the Jupiter incident, how they were hiding on the dark side of the moon, uh, which really makes no sense if you have a spacefaring society because the far side of the moon becomes like, oh, I'm going down to the shops, right? The far side of the moon is just like, you know, in your backyard. But um, yeah, it, I mean, literally, dynamically, the dark side of the moon uh is very or the far side of the moon is very easy to get to and so nasa is actually talking about it and uh so at the russian space agency they're talking about uh 2030 as one of their proposals but the the us and nasa has its own idea its own time scale and if you are going to the moon it makes a lot of sense to have a station there at the very least you want to have uh halo satellites up there um and this is no reference to the game Halo. It's not like a ring of solid matter. A halo orbit is something that orbits around the Lagrange point, uh, specifically the L2 Lagrange point, and it can orbit around that and remain visible to the Earth and the dark side of the moon. So it's actually a great place to put like communication satellites, and you can do the same thing with a space station, I guess. Anyway, we're now coming in at... Uh, well, my usual double speed, we're just going to hook this on to the back there. And now we have a complete and functional moon station. Well, I mean, we have the ways to move it out there. That was a wonderful image there, showing the whole thing silhouetted against the sun, wasn't it? Yeah, you'll notice that the um, launcher I used here has a you know bits miss out of it for the room to basically make the 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 nuclear engines have have room the, the the RCS tanks or have a hole in them, that's what I'm saying not that we're leaking anything still we have plenty of fuel to get home we're just going to do the standard DR but using RCS, oh that was fast <laughs> it's the wonders of post editing, you really don't want to see me sitting for like 10 minutes firing RCS to deorbit a 100 ton spacecraft I also note that I actually managed to forget to put the uh landing gear on this so this was a test that to see whether it would be able to land on the parachutes uh, and I also forgot to map the parachutes correctly to the action groups so uh, <laughs> we reduced our vertical velocity down to just over five meters per second and we're gonna land taking most of the force on that main uh, mainsail engine and we just don't want it to explode well nothing exploded um, nothing actually looks like it fell. Oh, no. Looks like a jet engine has fallen off. Well, let's check the post-mission report. See what it says. Ah, yes. We lost a jet engine. But it's still intact. So, technically, I still have not destroyed any still any item yet. So far, 100% success rate. There's something I note with some pride. Honestly, actually, I haven't been keeping count of how many items have been attached to all these spacecraft. And, um... 
I imagine at some point I'm going to have to go back when something is destroyed and it becomes a 99.99999% you know reusable. Anyway, we are setting forth for the moon, so we need to replenish the supplies in the the Mooner station and the Mooner transfer vehicle. Um, that is why we have a space station here, right? The whole idea is it's going to be doing all the carrying all the load, folding out solar panels there, and we're just going to turn this around. And I think I think Moonrise is going to come in a, a minute or so, so we're pretty well lined up for this. Um, this spacecraft that is acting as a tug is actually also going to be the lander right now. You see it has landing legs, it's set up for landing, and it also has uh, docking ports at both ends. So technically it could also act in a pooling style, but given that there's, you know, um, solar panels and stuff that we don't want to subject to hot nuclear plasma, we will probably use this in pushing style, regardless of how problematic that can be. And uh, yeah, you, having two two nuclear engines also makes things a whole lot easier. It's really interesting to watch in the, the map view as I'm playing this at eight times normal speed. You see how wobbling back and forth causes the ascending and descending node lines to, to wobble. Anyway, there we are. We got our, imp our encounter. And well, once we get out there, we'll adjust ourselves into low lunar orbit. There we go watching it come in. Now we want to be doing orbiting the moon from uh, from right to left. Well at least I want to because that means that we will be uh, moving in the same direction as the lunar rotation so that if the moon um, if when we launch we're taking full advantage of the very 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 tiny amount of uh, rotational velocity the moon gives us. Now we're just doing our orbital insertion. We're just going to try and Set, get ourselves in a relatively circular orbit and you see me kind of poking this around here trying to get this right uh, the, I do have mech jeb fitted but I somehow doubt that it will be particularly good with something that has all these extra things added but there we are we now have a station we have a landing vehicle but we're not going to land just yet because we never want to leave any of these things unmanned, right? We are going to take a... This is going to be another spacecraft. This is essentially going to be the workhorse that is going to tran handle transporting stuff to and from the moon, between moon and uh, low carbon orbit. Uh, it only needs one nuclear rocket in this case. That explains the kind of wasp-wasted design on this spacecraft. But... Uh, other than that, you know, it has a bunch of uh, space for pilots and a fuel tank. It's not really going to transport much fuel between low lunar orbit and, uh, and or sorry, between low carbon orbit and lunar orbit. It probably need to build a fuel tanker for that specific thing. But I suspect that if all things go well, I will be doing this in the reverse. So uh, look at that. Just come up within a few kilometers, arrest my velocity. Uh, looks like I've run out a little bit of fuel there. But, um, you know, transferring the fuel forwards into this spacecraft because we know we only needed the RCS on the other component to fly home. We're just going to zip in towards, uh, towards Olympus, Mount Olympus, where the gods would reign over the world and occasionally throw giant thunderbolts upon people or turn into cows and things like that. Greek history is great, or Greek not history, Greek mythology is great. Greek history is great too, but Greek mythology is insane. I love those stories. Hey, I mean, I did name up my kid Orion, so go figure. So yeah, let's, uh, we're just going to come around, and I guess we have a nice, nice free docking berth up here. That's us. I mean, the, the moon station that was described that uh, NASA and the Russians, they both talk about having docking capability for up to six spacecraft at once, which uh, would be quite a sight to behold. Uh, you know, it's like uh, Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral, they had the capability to have multiple rockets in the la or multiple shuttle launches, right? But there was only one time that they ever rolled out both shuttles and the launch pad at the same time, and that was during the the last sh uh, Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. That was because they needed to have a contingency plan available should there be a problem during launch. But there! That's us! We're going to leave it there for now. That will make its way out to the moon, and that will be the relief crew. Unfortunately, you notice 
It is Jeb and Bill again. The game has somehow given me two copies of Jeb and Bill, and they will meet up in Moonor Orbit. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.